Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship this morning. Good morning. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, and we continue to wait and anticipate and prepare to come close to the mystery of Christmas and the birth of the Prince of Peace. We are gathered in our pajamas, a lot of us this morning, for worship today to focus our attention on the night, on the stillness, as well as the mysterious ways that God shows up in the dark, in dreams and visions and angels in pursuit of peace. May peace for ourselves and our world be on our hearts as we worship this day. I'd like to invite all the kids forward to help me light the candles this morning, our Christ candle and our rainbow candle, and do the lamp acknowledgement. Hey, Jack and Charlie. Jack, Charlie, come light the candles. Yeah, you guys are doing the readings, right? Yeah. No, that's later, yeah. We are, Mom. So all the kids can join me around the front. I can't remember who lit last night. Was it Emma? Do you want to wait today? We'll take turns, right? We're going to start by lighting that Christ candle over there. And as we do, repeat after me, God surround us. God surround us. God surround us. Jesus walk with us. Jesus walk with us. Spirit light our path. Spirit light our path. All right. And we come over on this side. This way. We're going to light this candle. Well. Repeat after me in the light of Christ. In the light of Christ. All are loved and welcomed. All are loved and welcomed. And we're going to light this one in the corner over there. Our candle from last week. Our candle of hope. There we go. Let's have a seat and do our opening prayer together. She said she'd be Let's pray. Our most high God, you sent your messages in the dark of night to prepare us for the coming Son of God. The night is no stranger to you. You meet us in our dreams, in our thoughts, in the dark and in the morning sunrise. As we join together today in worship, we direct our attention toward your message and your messengers, speaking to us in word and song and prayer and words. You call us on a journey of faithfulness through light and darkness, and no matter where we find ourselves, may we discover the Prince of the Peace of Christ among us today. Amen. I invite you to place your hands or feet firmly on the ground as we do our land acknowledgement this morning. Here in this place, we give thanks to the land and its first peoples who cared for it long before settlers arrived. Heaven of Parish gathers on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Dakota, Dene, and Oji Cree peoples and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Each time we speak these words, we recommit ourselves to learning about the land and its first peoples, past and present, and to developing reconciled relationships. May it be so. Jack, yeah. you want to find a spot on our table for our feather? Oh, nice. That's lovely. Thank you. We want to start with our gathering song this morning, which is Voices United number one. Very first song in your hymnal, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. We'll be singing verses 1, 2, and 7. 1, 2, and 7.
invite our Advent candle readers and lighters forward to our, our lighting for the day. When we are overwhelmed with conflict, without or within, the peace of Christ may be found. We welcome the peace of Christ present among us and available to all. Today, we light the candle of peace because peace has come to us. Let's turn to Voice of the United 6 and sing verse 2 of a candle is burning as we light the second candle. together that is found in your bulletins. Welcome, peace of Christ. We breathe in your presence, which sustains us and makes us whole. Where will we find you today? Let us pray. Our Most High God, we find peace in you because you made yourself low, living among us and experiencing our human struggles. We call upon your promise of peace today. Where there is war, let there be an end to the violence. Where there is anxiety, let there be serenity. Where there is fear, let there be an assurance of safety. Where there is darkness with no light, or light with no rest, may your peace abound in our hearts and minds. We find peace in your promise proclaimed so long ago. Of your kingdom there will be no end. Amen. I want to invite all the kids to join me around the campfire for our story today. And it was an angel. 
there was an angel right in her house. And Mary just sat so still. And the angel said, Greetings, favored one. And Mary did not know what to do. She was so confused. Why was there an angel in her house? And why was the angel calling her favored one? And the angel very smartly said, Don't be afraid. It's okay. You're going to be okay. I have a really important message for you. You are going to have a baby. Yeah, that comes later. You can know your story. Yeah. And the angel said, You're going to have a baby. And you're going to name the baby Jesus. And this Jesus is going to be the Son of God Most High. And he's going to be like a king. But instead of having just one nation that he rules, his reign will go forever and ever. And Mary was like, excuse me, I think you have the wrong person. And the angel said, no, 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 no. It's you. And Mary said, but I'm not married yet. Joseph and I aren't even married. We can't have a baby yet. And the angel said, it's going to be okay. The Holy Spirit is going to surround you, and you're going to start to grow a baby in your womb. And the baby, when he's born, you'll call him Jesus, and he will be great. And I know this is super hard to believe, but your cousin, Elizabeth, who's way too old to have a baby, she's pregnant right now. She's already in her sixth month. So when you go to visit her, you'll know what I'm telling you is true. <clears throat> Mary sat there and went, hmm, this is pretty scary, but I want to be part of this. So she said, okay, let it be exactly as you said. And the angel vanished. That's a story that's in the Gospel of Luke in the Bible. But in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew tells a different story. Matthew tells a story about Joseph. So Joseph was engaged to be married to who? Who is Joseph going to marry? Yeah, Joseph's going to marry Mary. Joseph was engaged to be married to Mary. They weren't married yet. But Joseph heard Mary was pregnant with the Holy, by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph was like, what on earth does that mean? We are supposed to get married, and we are supposed to have a family. And suddenly, Mary is having a baby. I don't even know what to do. He knew what the other men in his town would have done. They would have dragged Mary into the middle of town and told everybody the mistake she made. But Joseph... He cared about Mary. He didn't want to hurt her. So he was like, what am I going to do? And what if she's telling the truth? What if the baby's really by the Holy Spirit? What if an angel did visit her? Well, I don't want to hurt her. So he worried and wondered and paced. Till the middle of the night, he walked around his house. He didn't know what to do. And finally he thought, okay, what I'll do is I'll go find Mary really quietly. And I'll say, what? We've got to end our engagement. And then what I'll do is I'll just I'll just go work in another town for a bit. I'm a carpenter. I can find work. And then everything will blow over, and it'll be okay. And then Mary will be okay, too. So he made this decision, and he went and he tried to get some sleep. But he didn't sleep very well. In the middle of the night, he had a dream. But the dream felt so real. He woke up. <coughs> he felt like there was something on the end of his bed. And he looked up, and there was an angel sitting on the end of his bed. And the angel said, don't be afraid, because that's what angels always say. The angel said, don't be afraid. I know you've made a decision. It's not the right one. You need to keep your engagement to Mary. Marry her. She is going to have a baby. You're going to name him Jesus. And he is going to be son of God. He's the one you've all been waiting for. He will be Emmanuel, the Son of God, God with us, who will save all of your people. Oh, whoa. What on earth was happening? So Joseph listened, and he fell back asleep. And when he woke up, 
He did exactly what the angel said. He married Mary. Yeah, it's tricky every way you look at it, right? There's no easy way out of this one. It's tricky, right? Because Jesus is going to be the Son of God. And I bet Joseph was wondering, now, this is not my child, but I'm going to be his dad. So it's like he's adopted, right? Baby Jesus is going to be adopted by Joseph. There's so much to wonder about in this story. I wonder, I wonder what angels look like, because we don't really know. You know for sure what an angel looks like? Yeah, Do you know what they say about angels in the Bible? Some angels look a little bit like people. Some of them have six sets of wings, and some of them are covered in eyes. I know, there are lots of different ways that people think about angels. We don't know for sure what they look like, so it's a lot to wonder about. I know. <laughs> yep, sometimes we think they're white. Lots of times we think they're really bright, and the Bible tells us that they're really, really bright, that they kind of have light around them. It's pretty, no one knows for sure, unless you've seen an angel. And I'm not going to say no one here has seen an angel. I don't know your stories. Who knows? Before you head down to practice your singing for Sunday school, let's pray together. Oh, hang on. Yes. If you're born to an angel, you better be very spooky and you better set up a good trap so they don't come down to you. <laughs> no. Well, the time is that they smoke little crabs. We have no idea. But, but you know, um, angels are smart and people are smart. Yeah, that is true. But some animals are smart and That is also true. Let's pray before you head downstairs. God, we are so grateful for these stories that we have in the Gospels, for the story from Luke and the story from Matthew. We're grateful that your visitors came to see Mary and came to see Joseph. And we are grateful that we can wonder in the dark about all the amazing things that you do in the world. Amen. All right, you can head downstairs with Myra. Oh, I like this so tired so I'm to leave that. Let us receive God's word from the scriptures. May it light our way as a pillar of fire and be a cloud of shelter for our souls. I want to read directly from the Bible the stories that I just told. You'll notice that some of what I said is not directly in the Bible, but that's how we actually learn stories of the Bible, is by imagining them and putting ourselves in those stories. This is how Luke tells our story today. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? 
The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Our second reading today is from Matthew 1, verses 18 through 24a. Now the birth of Jesus. The Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Do you ever wonder what it would be like to be visited by an angel? To have a divine being suddenly appear in your midst and tell you what is to happen and what you are to do about it? I admit there is some appeal in that for me. It's appealing to have someone else make the decision, to hear a clear word, to have the course just plotted out for me. How often do we as people sit at crossroads or in the dark entirely and wish that someone would just tell us what to do. Wish that God would make the way abundantly clear. And here in our text today, God does. God sends angels directly to Mary and Joseph and just lays it all out for them. And their responses are clear too. Mary says, let it be with me according to your word. In other words, okay, and Joseph just does as he's told. At first glance, it all sounds so simple and straightforward, just so easy. It almost makes me wish for an angel. But the best way to read scripture is not usually in first glances. So let's take a look at these encounters again, starting with Mary. The text starts off right at the beginning with in the sixth month. In the sixth month of what? If we look back a bit, we find that an angel of the Lord visited the priest Zechariah while he was in the temple. The angel told him that his wife, Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, would conceive a child even though she's long past childbearing years. And she does. And after having been in seclusion for five months, her pregnancy is now out in the open for everyone to see. God has turned her family's life upside down and an angel of God got the ball rolling. That's the backdrop for the story of Mary in the sixth month of Elizabeth's remarkable pregnancy. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. While Mary doesn't yet know what has happened to Elizabeth, she soon will. For now, she's just living her life, going about her tasks, sleeping in her home. What we do know, what we are told, is that an angel comes to her and said, says, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. And Mary is perplexed. She is confused. Why is this happening? 
probably not why is an angel appearing to a human, but why is this angel appearing to her? Mary is a Jewish girl. She's not oblivious to the great stories of her ancestors. She knows that God sends angels to people. She knows that people find favor with God. She also knows who those people are and what God's favor meant for them. I don't want to get into a long treatise on angels here, or we could be here all day. Suffice it to say that angels of God appeared to her ancestors and then stuff happened. Big stuff happened to them. And there are many greats among her people who have found favor with God, and it turned their lives upside down. We think of Noah, Joseph, Moses, Ruth, Samuel, Esther, Daniel, and the list goes on. To find favor with God is no small thing. She knows that none of these were great in their own right before finding favor. But that because they found favor and stepped into that favor, they are remembered as faithful, as leaders of her people. And so she is perplexed. Why is this angel here now speaking with me? What is about to happen? And the angel tells her the unbelievable, that she's going to conceive and carry a child in her womb and have a son and name him Jesus. He'll be great, the son of God, who will have the throne of David, and his kingdom will have no end. And I love her question after hearing all of this news. She doesn't question that she's enough or the right person. She doesn't question that her child might be the son of God or great or a king. She questions how this could be possible since her people can see through marital relations and she's not married yet. And the angel informs her that she will conceive through the spirit. And thinking she might just need a little bit of proof about this, the angel lets her know that the physically unbelievable has already happened. Her cousin Elizabeth is pregnant. Nothing is impossible with God. So Mary says, okay, here I am. May it be so. My favorite words in this passage, the whole passage, are perplexed, pondered, and how. They say so much about the entire story. They float above and below, in and around this whole encounter. And I cannot hear Mary's response to the angel without them. Mary doesn't respond from a place of certainty or clarity, but from perplexity and wonder. She doesn't step into a plan that makes sense to her, or that seems perfectly doable, but into mystery as her ancestors had done for millennia. Theologian Lillian Daniel says, perplexity as a state of mind is hugely underrated in our sure-footed society. Think about what we want in a leader these days, she says. We want someone who knows what he wants, is clear on what she thinks, makes a decision, and makes it quickly. Think how strange it would be to hear a news anchor describe the president, or prime minister, as confused. Imagine it. In his radio address to the nation this week, the president, when looking at the state of the nation, the state of the world, the attacks from opposing political parties, as well as various natural disasters and diseases facing the world, had this response. Quite frankly, I'm perplexed. But sometimes I wish I would hear that. For there's a news flash right here in the Bible that the most important woman in the world the one who is about to give birth to the Son of God, the one who will have to tell her beloved news of a pregnancy that will bring scandal to their life, the one who will sit at the foot of the cross, heroically suffering her son into eternity, the one who now, as a young girl, will have to have the strength to travel long distances in miles and even greater distances in faith, begins her adventure in a state of perplexity. From the moment the angel greets her, she is confused. I love that. I love that she's confused and I love Lily and Daniel's take on it. I am confused a lot. Aren't we all? It's a relief to know that we can be. That it's possible to step out in faith to do great and difficult things or even everyday things from a place of unknowing. 
It's a relief to know I don't always have to know. On any given Sunday, I'm sure there are those of us who look around and wonder, am I the only one who isn't sure about this stuff, this God business? Or the one who looks around and wonders, am I the only one who believes this stuff? The truth is, we're never the only one. Even if we all walk in confidently and sit down with certainty and do all the worship things as expected, the truth is that none of us has it all together. And we don't have to. And to all this, Lily and Daniels offer this small comfort. If the mother of God got to be perplexed, you can be too. In fact, let's take perplexity out of the old room closet, dust it off, shine it up, and put it up on the mantelpiece in the middle of the ecclesiological living room, because a little perplexity can be a wonderful thing in the life of faith. For that matter, let's stop whitewashing Mary into some paragon of girlish obedience and see her instead as the complicated woman she was, a person of complexity, a person of perplexity. How could she be anything else? Amen. How could she have been anything else? An angel plopped into her life and told her she was about to be the mother of the child of God. Who on earth could get their head around that? And scripture never tells us that she did. Alongside her ascent to step into this mystery, scripture tells us she was perplexed. That she pondered. That she asked questions. And later, we're told she treasured all the mysterious things that occurred and then pondered them some more. There are so many ways that we can interpret the story of Mary. Maybe she's obedient, or submissive, or brave, or bold, or compulsive, or hope-filled. I think of her as trusting, trusting in God's mystery, finding peace in the call in the midst of unknowing. Joseph's story is also one of mystery. I'm not really sure that you can have a story with an angel in it that's not one of mystery. Joseph went to bed one night with the weight of the world on his chest. He was engaged to be married, but now his soon-to-be wife was pregnant by the Spirit. And what did that even mean? What on earth was he supposed to do? How could he explain this? to his family and his community in any way that would have made sense. But he cared about Mary. He was a person of great faith, a righteous man. He didn't want to disgrace her, so he planned to dismiss her quietly. And he didn't come to that decision lightly. The text says he resolved to do this. We can imagine him tossing and turning, praying, weighing all the options, his heart in his throat. Then when he finally makes the decision, he falls into a fitful sleep. And that's when the angel of the Lord makes an appearance. In the stories of his people, it is never clear if the angel of the Lord is God's messenger or is actually God. Regardless, one does not take their appearance lightly. And the angel says, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. It's true. The child of the Holy Spirit, she will have a son, you are to name him Jesus. He will save your people from their sins. And that is quite a pronouncement. It's also quite a confirmation of Mary's story. In this text, I appreciate the word unwilling. Joseph was unwilling to cause harm to Mary. He wrestled with this and resolved to respond in the least harmful way he knew how. But when guided to another option by God or God's messenger, he took it. Joseph's story is one of wrestling and decision-making, of listening, and of changing course. It's one of trusting in God's mystery, finding peace in the call in the midst of unknowing. And for both Mary and Joseph, the peace they seem to find in the mystery is peace accompanied by fear and perplexity, rather than a peace that just eliminates it. They were in a complex situation and there was reason to be afraid of what was to come. To become pregnant while engaged at that time was one thing. 
To become pregnant by someone other than your betrothed was another. To become pregnant outside of marriage by the Holy Spirit was something else entirely. I highly doubt that the village was receptive if they even disclosed that information, and I'm pretty sure they did not. After his birth, King Herod, out of fear, wanted Jesus killed. Mary and Joseph, warned by an angel, fled to safety in Egypt. But countless children were killed by that angry king. So I imagine that fear had a fairly consistent ebb and flow for the parents of the Messiah, appearing and drifting away and appearing again throughout Jesus' life, which was nothing if not mysterious. I sometimes think the angels are expecting a lot when they say, do not be afraid. Alongside the logistics of the call being made, there's the whole angel thing. Our culture does paint angels as infinitely unscary. They are adorable, ephemeral, delicate, sometimes gorgeous, and almost always female. But there's not much in scripture that actually leads to those descriptions. In Numbers, the angel of the Lord has a sword. In Daniel, the angel looks like a man in linen with a gold belt. His body looks like a gemstone, his face is like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arm and, arms and legs are like bronze, and a voice like a multitude. And that is not nearly as strange as it gets. Needless to say, the angelic bare bottom winged babies we see on Valentine's Day bear absolutely no resemblance to the biblical image of an angel or the cherubim. So while we don't know exactly what Gabriel looked like, when appearing to Mary, or the angel of the Lord in Joseph's dream, there's a pretty good chance they were fearsome. The history of angelic visitation among the people of Israel was also good reason to be afraid. Angels didn't visit people to invite them to meander into the common predictable future they imagined for themselves. The angels who visited Abraham came to direct him and Sarah down a path toward more joy and sorrow than they could ever have imagined. Isaiah saw a seraphim with six wings who commissioned him to become a prophet of God to his people. Daniel heard Gabriel speak of a great war. Visits from angels could be both beautiful and horrible at the same time, and always the call was an invitation to something beyond imagining or human scheming. I often wonder if it might not have been kinder for the angels to say, we know you're afraid, that's okay. Or your fear makes sense even though nothing else I'm going to tell you does. But what they do say is do not be afraid and somehow that seems to be what's needed for folks like Mary and Joseph to step out in faith and into mystery. I guess what I'm saying with all of this talk about angels is that if you're not sure about all this God stuff, that's okay. If you're perplexed about the coming of the Son of God and what it means for the world, you're in very good company. So was Mary. If you're afraid about what God might be asking of you, so was Joseph. And whatever your invitation is, whatever your perplexity, whatever questions you have, God's mystery can handle it and somehow in the midst of it all bring peace. Amen. Our song of response today is Voice United number eight. Lo how a rose they're blooming.
This song we've just sung speaks of a rose blooming in the cold of winter, a savior blossoming in the darkness of our world to show God's love aright. It's a song of mystery. Today we want to pray together, led by Mary's song, which speaks of that great mystery. She sings of mercy that extends to the fearful, the scattering of the proud, the downfall of rulers and the rich, the rising of the humble and the feeding of the hungry. She sings of God's kingdom come like a rose in winter. We want to join her voice. We'll end by singing the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. Lord, we wait with eager expectation for the coming of your kingdom. When the humble will be exalted and the hungry fed, your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we prepare for your advent with searching minds and contrite hearts, trusting in your healing spirit and redemptive love. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we watch with those who wait and weep, longing to see the rule of justice and the reign of peace. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we seek you among the despised and rejected, knowing that there we will find your light shining in the dark. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we proclaim sight to the blind and liberty to the oppressed. Trusting in your tender mercy and passion for justice. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we work with others to proclaim your truth. Challenging the mighty and raising the meek. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we wrestle with our hopes and our fears, our struggles and our joys laboring with creation to come to new birth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, the coming of your kingdom is a mystery that we long for, and so we sing for that great mystery to bloom in our midst. Let us sing together. Something that's this past week for which you are grateful. Kids too. 
All the kids as well. Kids over there. Hello. Children. Hi. I want to invite everyone now to close your eyes and take a moment to recall something this past week for which you are grateful. Some small blessing. For each of these, we give thanks. Gratitude is the foundation of generosity. Each week we have the opportunity to practice generosity through our gifts of time and energy, compassion, our abilities, and our money, and we do this together. The gifts that you leave in our offering plate by the entrance way, they do make our work possible. And the gifts that you give to mission and service, they have untold impact around the world. And the practical gifts that you've been bringing every week for the cheer board will be huge signs of love and compassion. And so we thank you for your generosity. For all the gifts we have received, for all the gifts we have shared, may all be drawn into God's good purposes for this world. Amen. Let us sing uh, a blessing to one another as we go. Voices United 964, go now in peace. Let us share the peace of Christ with one another.